Hello, and thanks for joining us again. The COVID pandemic already has led to nearly 60,000 deaths in the US alone. Yesterday, that number surpassed the 58,000 who died in Vietnam, 58,000 Americans who died in Vietnam. Millions more are out of work. That's a lot of pressure for any leader, the president, our governors, our mayors, our local university and hospital officials. It can take its toll, including on the leader's ability to maintain a steady hand. Sometimes when we read history, we miss the humanity and courage and even fear that our leaders face in these moments. The Miller Center has a unique and invaluable window into the pressure at the highest level, our mastery of the secret White House tapes. We're excited to have Mark Silverstone, chair of the Center's Presidential Recordings Program an associate and an associate professor with us at the Miller Center in Presidential Studies. Mark and his team are what I call audio archaeologists. They listen to and transcribe those secret White House tapes of, in particular, Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. That actually combines two very hard jobs. The first is simply getting the transcripts correct. The tapes often, but not always, come with the date and time of the meeting or phone call in question for the president, and maybe a few taglines about the topics involved and the participants on the call. So Mark and his team have to match the voices that they hear to the names. Um, and they have to know the full range of issues being discussed from Vietnam to Watergate to Cuban missiles, to the Cuban civil rights movement, to Medicare and Medicaid. The second part is helping us, that is the wider world, understand why any particular conversation is important. That is, our team are not just stenographers or archivists, though that job is hard enough. They're scholars. They have to go beyond transcribing to write historical assessments of some of those major issues informed by what they hear on the tapes. So in addition to overseeing all that work, Mark is the author of a highly awarded book on the United States, Great Britain in the early Cold War, and is a lauded scholar in the area of presidents and presidential decision-making. We are beyond lucky to have him at the center and with us today. Mark will be guiding us through several domestic and foreign policy challenges faced by those three presidents and their administrations. Um, fittingly enough, the day after the death toll in the United States surpassed that in Vietnam. That was a crisis that started uh, really in the Kennedy administration and as we know ended toward the end of and after the Nixon administration. Through this, Mark will try to give us a sense of the major trade-offs previous presidents have faced when managing crises, including the toll that those crises took on those presidents and their administrations. So Mark, uh, thanks for being with us today and uh, really looking forward to this. Uh, why don't you get us started? Great, uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, really pleased to be here with everybody. Let me share my screen so that uh, we can all see what it is that that I'd like to share uh, today. Uh, there we go. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the White House tapes, I would just say that began making these secret private recordings in, in 1940, when Roosevelt turned on his taping machine uh, and uh, they stopped doing it in July of 1973 when uh, Nixon turned his machine off. Uh, and the tapes give us uh, pretty good snapshots of what was going on in the Oval Office at various points in time. They're hardly the only pictures we have of what presidents were thinking and doing in the White House, but they're sufficiently candid. We can listen in on how policy was made and how power was used at several critical junctures. This morning and the cost of the crisis we're now all, all gripped by. I thought it focused on more or less crisis moments, but also some moments of opportunity during Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon presidencies, the presidencies that are best captured by the White House tapes, uh, as some food for thought uh, at a time when many are looking to Washington for guidance support, and for solutions. Uh, President Kennedy began to tape his conversations until late July 1962, 
we don't have that real-time commentary on the Bay of Pigs or Laos or Berlin that would have been invaluable for understanding the interior of those policy made challenges. But because he flipped the switch that summer, uh, we do have roughly 30 hours of recordings out of about uh, 260 hours that Kennedy made overall on the most significant foreign policy crisis of the Kennedy presidency and, and arguably of any Cold War presidency, that being the Cuban Missile Crisis. The origins of that crisis stretch back to the emergence of Fidel Castro as strongman in 1959 and his increasing ties to the Soviet Union and to U.S. plans to overthrow Castro that Kennedy inherited from President Eisenhower uh, and that he implemented in April 1961 with significant modifications to be sure and to disastrous effect of the Bay of Pitt. Kennedy learned some key lessons uh, from the debacle about how to improve the policy process, the kinds of personnel he needed around himself, uh, and the need at times not to trust the so-called experts. But he didn't learn that much constructively about policy priorities because he continued to target Castro for removal. Even after he'd been advised, Cuba was a thorn in the side and, and not a dagger to the heart. In fact, Kennedy's decision to double down on ousting Castro contributed to Moscow's to deploy nuclear missiles to Cuba. That wasn't the only reason the Soviets made the deployment, but it was a significant one. Still, I'd say that those learnings that Kennedy did from the 1961 failure served him well during those 13 days in October of 1962. Among them was his decision to gather together on a sustained basis, the key national security officials of the government to game out various options and maneuvers they hope would lead to the removal of the Soviet group. The Executive National Security Council, or XCOM, served as the administration's decision-making hub throughout the crisis, a vast process, really, for the way that Kennedy had managed the Bay of Pigs. In terms of personnel, Kennedy recognized the need for loyalists, but particularly those who could give it to him straight. And among those he came to rely on increasingly was his brother, Robert, the attorney general. At various points in the missile crisis, Kennedy also rejected advice from the experts, uh, particularly Pentagon officials who asserted that a military option, airstrikes first on Cuba, followed by a U.S. invasion, was really the only option that he had to choose from. But it wasn't just those officials who he sidelined. Kennedy really kept his own counsel during the crisis, deciding that in the final analysis, he would trade NATO missiles in Turkey for Soviet missiles in Cuba, a decision that, as you can hear in this audio clip from the height of that, generated a lot of pushback from his closest civilian and, and military aides. Uh, and in this clip, we'll hear from Alex Johnson, the Deputy Undersecretary of State, and McGeorge Black Kennedy's National Security Advisor. I think we got to have two questions. One is, do we want to have these conversations go on on Turkey and these other matters while we can sort of stand still in Cuba? Or do we want to say that we won't talk about Turkey and these other matters until they settle the Cuban crisis? Are there two different questions? I don't think we're going to get there. They're not going to announce they're taking a public position. Obviously, they're not going to settle the Cuban question until we get some conversation with Cuba. Because that being true, are we in the best position now with him and publicly to say we're glad to discuss this matter and there's no question of verification and all the rest once we get a hard indication that they've ceased their work in Cuba. Otherwise, uh, what we're really saying is we won't discuss Turkey until they settle Cuba. And I think that he will then come back and say the United States refused his offer. And I don't think that's as good a position as saying we're glad to discuss his offer. If we can get a standstill in Cuba. That puts us in a much stronger world position because most people think his office is rather reasonable. Yes, the only question I'd like to raise about that is that it really injects Turkey as a, as a quid my or for uh, well, the negotiations. The point is, is the point is that we're not in a position today to make the trade. That's number one. And we won't be if the trade may be made in three or four days. I don't know. We have to wait to see what Turkey We don't want to be 
We don't want the Soviet Union or the United Nations to be able to say that the United States is general. So I think we're better off to stick on the question of freeze, and then we'll discuss it. Well, I don't think there's any here, but there really are. I think if we sound as if we wanted to make this trade to our NATO people, to all the people who are tied to us by alliance, we are in real trouble. And I think that you know, we we we'll all join in doing this if it's the decision, but I think we should, we should tell you that that's the universal assessment that everyone in the government has been connected with these alliance problems. The trade went through, you know, and remarkably, and, and partly through luck, I would say, we came through the crisis unscathed. But it wasn't only luck that uh, allowed Kennedy and his team to succeed. And this exchange points up some lessons I think are worth considering. Uh, first, play for time. Keep the conversation with your adversary going uh, so you can find a way toward a, a resolution, uh, especially when uh, nuclear war and Armageddon are on the table. Uh, to paraphrase Winston Churchill in this vein, jaw jaw is better than war war. Uh, make sure you sound, uh, surround yourself with individuals who've got your back but who can also speak truth to power and be absolutely straight with you. Uh, it does a president no good to be served by yes men and women. Make sure it's the two processes that put all options on the table uh, so that you have a range of policy responses that you've been able to vet and can select from. Uh, and there are other relevant lessons to be drawn from the crisis that don't come through in this particular uh, TXCon meeting. But suffice it to say that in learning from his mistakes, Kennedy was able to turn his failure at the Bay of Pigs into his success at managing the missile crisis. Though as successful as Kennedy had been in going eyeball to eyeball with us in the Caribbean, he'd come into that crisis having floundered a bit just weeks earlier in a crisis involving civil rights when he was forced to steer down segregationists in Mississippi over the enrollment of a black at the state's flagship campus in Oxford. The crisis at Ole Miss was a local conflict with national implications and even global ones, given the way that America's adversaries were using the persistence of Jim Crow in their anti-American propaganda, neatly captured here, I think, by her block in 1961. It was acutely conscious of the intersection between the Cold War abroad and still it's at home. Kennedy actually came into the presidency with a, a real commitment to civil rights, uh, having supported an aggressive party plank during the campaign, which included broad powers for the Justice Department to initiate school education, uh, the creation of a permanent Fair Employment Practices Commission, uh, even a pledge to change Senate rules to make it easier to end filibusters. And he quickly backed away from those goals once he was elected. Uh, and then certainly once he became president, uh, fearing that if he went forward with them, several congressmen who chaired key committees would block his broader legislative agenda, which included matters such as raising the minimum wage or aid to aid or uh, medical care for the age. With respect to civil rights, uh, Kennedy was most concerned about how efforts to ground decision of 1954 would play out during his administration as school desegregation fights were likely to be some of those contentious of the day, as it already proved to be uh, with the experience of Little Rock in 1957. And that crisis, in fact, dramatized for Kennedy the dangers that awaited him if he did go through with uh, pushing school desegregation. Which brings us to Ole Miss. Uh, James Meredith was an Air Force man who, began in 1961, had tried to transfer from all-black Jackson State uh, to the University of Mississippi at Oxford. After his application was rejected, uh, he sued to gain entrance to the Oxford campus. Uh, his case then moved through the courts in 1961-62, and by September of 1962, Associate Justice to the Supreme Court, Hugo Black, had confirmed Meredith's legal right to attend Old Miss and ordered that he in fact be admitted. That placed Meredith and the United States government in direct confrontation with Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett. And over the course of about two weeks from mid to late September, 1962, Attorney General Robert Kennedy had numerous conversations with Barnett 
about plans to ensure Meredith's ability to enroll with Barnett putting up roadblocks each step of the way. By September 29th, with Meredith on campus and thousands of hostile segregationist whites arriving to prevent his enrollment, President Kennedy finally got more involved by speaking to Barnett. And I'd like to play a snippet of one of their calls. They didn't have many, but here's one of them, uh, which took place that afternoon, September 29th, before things really out of control that evening. Well, now, here's my problem, Governor. Uh, this uh, and I didn't uh, put him in the university, but on the other hand, under the Constitution, I have to carry out the orders of the, carry that order out. I don't, I get, uh, I don't want to do it in any way that causes uh, difficulty to you or to anyone else, but I've got to do it. Now, I'd like to get your help in doing that. Well, now, let me, let me say this. Uh, you know what I'm up against, Mr. President? I took an oath to abide to the laws of this state okay. and our constitution here and the constitution of the United States. I'm, I'm on the spot here, you know. Well, now, you've got to uh, take an oath to do that, and you know what our laws are. The yes, I understand that. The problem is, Governor, that uh, I got my responsibility just like you have yours, and my responsibility, of course, is to the... I realize that, and I appreciate that so much. Well, now, here's the thing, uh, Governor. I will, uh, the Attorney General can talk to uh, Mr. Watkins tomorrow. What I would like to do is to try to work this out in an amicable way. We don't want a lot of people down there getting hurt, and we don't want to have a... You know, it's very easy to... Let me say this. They're calling, calling me and others all over the state, wanting to bring a thousand, wanting to bring five hundred. I know. Well, I know. Well, we don't want to have a. Uh, we don't want to have a lot of people getting hurt or killed uh, down there. That's that's great. So, as you can hear, Kennedy approached this as a matter of law and order, really, and and not one of social justice. And this was indicative of his posture towards civil rights through that phase of his presidency. Uh, I'd also point out that this extended back and forth with Barnett, which stretched out over the better part of two weeks, certainly involving the attorney general, effectively gave Barnett a sense that he had some wiggle room in dealing with the administration over the manner and the timing of Merrick's involvement. Uh, adding to the chaos, uh, Kennedy was very reluctant to use federal troops to enforce the law. And his reticence also gave Barnett a sense he could continue to nibble away at, at Kennedy's resolve. So overall, uh, Kennedy's failure to act more decisively and with a greater show of federal force at an earlier point in the crisis led to a virtual riot on campus, uh, the deaths of two individuals, and a guy for the administration, uh, one they came to acknowledge, quite frankly, and which they reflected on the following June when the matter of integrating the University of Alabama became a, a point of tension. Kennedy ultimately came to embrace the civil rights struggle as a moral one, uh, but only after the brutalities of, of Birmingham in 1963 uh, and the counsel that he got from Brother Robert, did he finally agree to introduce sweeping civil rights legislation to address the inequities and racist policies that Black Americans were facing on a daily basis legislation that ultimately would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Of course, Kennedy wouldn't get to see that legislation passed, uh, owing to the events of, of Dallas. Indeed, the very first crisis moment of the Johnson presidency was the one that elevated LBJ to that very office. It therefore fell to Johnson to reassure a distraught nation and present an image of stability to the country. That involved ensuring the continuity of government, but also addressing several matters related to the fall pre uh, fallen president, uh, accompanying his family and their grief at a time when Johnson Birch needed to assert his own being as the new president. Uh, it also involved deciding how Johnson would proceed with Kennedy's legislative programs and, and policy choices. And it involved trying to get to the bottom of what actually happened in Dallas, the murder itself. Johnson was fortunate uh, that he would approach these challenges at a time when the country was generally trusting of government institutions and looking to Washington for direction. Also, fortunately for posterity, uh, Johnson was in the habit of taping his telephone conversation, ultimately recorded about 650 hours of telephone tape and about 150 hours of meeting tape. And I'd like to play one of the many, many conversations that he taped 
escaped from Dallas, which highlights his leadership style, a style that was highly personal and in which he flattered or cajoled, uh, berated or, or otherwise uh, wrangled legislators and, and private individuals into doing what he wanted, uh, into doing what he wanted them to do, uh, essentially giving uh, them what many have referred to as the Johnson treatment. The conversation I'd like to play is with Republican Senator Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania, and came two days after Johnson addressed a joint session of Congress uh, in which he pledged to continue Kennedy's program and policies. Uh, the audio is a little bit faint in this one. Hugh, I asked Mr. Barrett. Uh, a friend of mine is in today, and. Uh... Telling me about some panel he saw you on was, I think, called and saw him pass story and said that you were uh, very uh, 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 partial to me and uh, very generous. And I won't tell you how much I appreciate your friendship. Well, sir, I, I want you to know that we, we're just praying for you. Well, I, I need it. I, got, I, I, I never needed it, it more in my life. And I need your friendship and I just appreciate it. And of course, well, We'll have differences as members of both parties always do, but uh, we will disagree without being disagreeable. You are always that way. You well, know? I I just, I, I'm only too anxious to help you wherever you can. And well, I'll tell you this, whatever the chips are down in foreign policy, if you need one vote, you've got it. Okay. Well, you, you've always been a good American. I appreciate it, but I didn't want you to think that I just took your friendship for granted. I did it. Did uh, like what I heard last night. He told a little group sitting around the house dinner how much it impressed him. And I'm damn glad that uh, that you you're not running in Texas because he'd vote Republican. And we've got more of them down there than we need anyway. Well, we we have to we have to have our differences. Sometimes on the floor, you know, I found uh, pretty partisan. No. You're one who will understand it. I sure do. Thank you, my friend. I want you to know it. I appreciate. it. That conversation is really typical LBJ. Even outside of that crisis moment, uh, that kind of bipartisanship comes through frequently on the Johnson tapes. Uh, I think we see it partly because there's a range of liberal and conservative voices within both parties at the time, but Johnson also had to mobilize those voices and finish their energies. Uh, and he knew while politics was, was bare knuckled and, and none too pretty, he also knew that the business of governing was about cultivating relationships uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, and that his adversaries today uh, might be his allies tomorrow. Johnson would confront several critical crisis moments before and after his election the following November, November 64, uh, oftentimes uh, involving matters related to civil rights and, and Vietnam, and we can certainly address those in the Q&A. Uh, but I'd like to highlight now how Johnson managed a different crisis moment, uh, a natural disaster, and, uh, and what it revealed about leadership skills. Uh, and that's when Hurricane Betsy hit New Orleans uh, as a Category 4 storm on September 9th, 1965, killing over 80 people and leaving disaster. The day after the hurricane hit, Louisiana Senator Russell Long, the Democratic whip in the Senate, and Johnson ally, called the president in dire straits, pleading with him for support. Uh, Johnson taped that call. I would say that the audio in this one is faint at times. Hello? Hello? Yes, Russell. Mr. President. Yes, yeah, take up. Mr. President, I've got Ed Bliss. He's in my time. Mr. President, besides the Great Lakes, the biggest lake I'm going to be is a bunch of them. It is now green dry. That hurricane said you picked the lake up and put it inside your Jefferson Parish in the third district. Now, <coughs> if I do say it, our people are just like wet, like my home. The whole damn home has been destroyed, but that's all right. My wife and kids are still alive, but okay. This is good that we have really had it down there. And we need your help. All right. Okay. Well, now, uh, if I didn't say it, uh, we lost one life before. Why we had lost one, I can't say. Grab the grab that big boy, the old tree, so it's not my house. My wife is getting, thank God, in the right room, so we're still alive. I don't think so bad. 
and late, but this spread in my seat on there and I'll show you. Ed Wood here. And my new thing is to let Hale Bond and every guy you want to let you pass it third by just counting yourself right now. If you want to go right now, you lost that state place. Take it out just like look at this right now. I'm going down there to the press and you see what happens. Right now, just go to my God, this is horrible. The federal construction by the Hill Park, the Upper Mall, the only thing is to save 5,000 miles. Now, if you want to do that, you can do it right now. Just pick one of the data black lips that you lost the last time. You can actually track them up. And what is the middle of the telephone that he knows like I do? But all you've got to do is to make a gentle gesture. Russell, I sure want to. I've got a hell of two days that I've got scheduled. Let me look and see what I can back out of and uh, get into and so on and so forth. Let me give you a run back. If I can't go out, but the best man I got there. Now, this, we are not the least bit interested in what best man is. I'm just a job. I'm a man. I know that. I know that. That's not my kid I said. I run for office next town. I love that uh, comment from from Long. Uh, I'm not the least bit interested in, in your best man, and he's on to something. Uh, hadn't made a consistent habit of visiting disaster areas up to that time. With fallout had generally been the province of, of local governments and the Red Cross with the Army Corps of, of Engineers lending a hand. But Johnson would alter the federal approach to managing disasters. Uh, in fact, of April that year, uh, after visiting Indiana in the wake of a bunch of devastating tornadoes, Johnson would say that at an hour and a time like this, the federal government must not be something cold and far away, but a warm friend and a warm neighbor. And that's how he'd respond to Betsy in September 5. Five hours after that call with Long, Johnson arrived in New Orleans, uh, making this one of the first examples of a president to act as a consoler in chief. A first hand look at the calamity, a demand that those surprised be helped, that the red tape getting in the way of helping them be cut. And he generally made the levers of government work. More than anything, I would say, Johnson conveyed that he had a, a personal investment in the welfare of those affected by the storm. Uh, he signaled that the federal government would step in not just to support the rebuilding of, of infrastructure, but to alleviate the suffering of individuals. And this episode is a great example of the kind of empathy, I think, that Americans have come to expect of their presidents, particularly in traumatic moments. It was a different kind of suffering that brought Richard Nixon to the presidency, given the apparent unraveling of American life in 1968. Uh, that year began the Tet Offensive in Vietnam and continued to jolt Americans at seemingly every turn with the withdrawal of Johnson from the presidential race in, in March, uh, the murders of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in April and June of that year, uh, chaos in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention that August, uh, much of which was related to fierce opposition to the continuing prosecution of the Vietnam War. Nixon hoped to move the country beyond Vietnam uh, to focus on other foreign policy priorities. Uh, with one of them being Crochemont with the People's Republic of China. Uh, many observers found his posture more than a little ironic. Uh, Nixon had been one of the fiercest red baiters in Congress. Uh, he'd re regularly criticized uh, Democrats for losing China in the 1950s. Uh, and then he was one of the, the leaders in the, in the 50s and 60s uh, 
or withholding diplomatic uh, recognition from communist China. But as he was gearing up for his presidential bid, uh, he began to think and speak about China differently. And he continued that once he became president, relaxing economic controls and trade restrict, uh, restrictions, uh, pledging to reduce the U.S. military presence on Taiwan, uh, referring to communist China as the People's Republic, its formal name, uh, and he would even drop the use of Peiping, the nationalist way of, of describing Peking, the, the Chinese uh, capital. And then in 1971, April of that year, after the People's Republic invited the U.S. ping pong team traveling in Asia to visit China, Nixon grasped the possibility that an opening to China might really be at hand. He's about the implications of such a gambit with national security advisor Kissinger in the middle of, and I'm going to play a portion of that tape. You'll hear music in the background. Uh, it's on Nixon's end of the phone, and, and we often hear music in the background when, when Nixon is on the phone. Now, on the China thing, what we have to realize, Henry, is that in terms of the American public opinion, it is still against communist China, you know. Right. So we're not uh, we're not making any boasts of this. Uh, uh, but the other intellectuals and the, the intellectuals will worry. They all worry about something. And uh, but but as we know, as we knew from the October seventh thing, it doesn't mean that we we get much from them. It'll just worry them to think that if something else is up. And uh, the uh, the uh, whole, the whole thing has got to be well played in terms of we don't. How about the the Taiwan thing? That's uh, sort of worrisome. I don't know a damn thing we do about those. Or what Taiwan thing? Well, I mean they're concerned about what we've said. Right, but they haven't expressed it yet, have they? I don't think so. Oh, I think there was something in the paper indicating that Taiwan was concerned. Well, that's, that's inevitable. They have to say that. And Bob Murphy going out there, I think, will uh, could they be concerned. It's. Uh, yeah. It is bound to be a worrisome thing to them. Well, Henry, uh, the thing uh, is, an historic change is going to take place. It has to take place. And it better take place when they've got a friend here rather than when they've got an enemy here. Right. And because it's of the tragedy that it has to happen to Chung at the end of his life. Yeah, but, uh, but we have to be cold about it. Yeah, we have to do what's best for us. Yeah. And, uh, and in the long term, it is essential for the values that he represents, that there be continuity in our government here. Yes, and that he has here an administration that is not going to just stand by and let Taiwan go down the drain. We're, we're trying to hold our position as best we can. Exactly. And, uh, but the, uh, for every reason, we've got to have uh, a diversion from Vietnam in this country for a while. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah. And we need it for our game with the Soviets. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it would be absolutely impossible if we would be doing the Soviets the greatest favor if we rejected this overture and we would get nothing for it. It would uh, it would lead to tougher relations between us and, and the Soviets rather than easier. That's right. That's right. That's, that's what they'd like for us to do. They'd like for us to sort of slap the Chinese in the face, but we're not doing it. We're, we're being, uh, we're not going overboard, but we're saying, well, if they open the door, we'll open the door. Nixon's gambit worked, uh, as his diplomacy helped to lead to summits with both China and Russia in 1972. Part of his plans for triangulating between the two to achieve several foreign policy objectives beyond rapprochement and, and including control with the Soviet. Uh, and one of those objectives was uh, to get some movement in Vietnam and, and to move toward peace and to extricate states. Uh, Beijing would eventually encourage Hanoi to settle with Washington uh, and seek the removal of U.S. troops from South Vietnam, figuring that once the United States was out of the picture, uh, Hanoi could move on Saigon uh, according to a timetable of its own choosing. In the near term, Vietnam would continue to present challenges. Uh, although Nixon's attempt to Vietnamize the war took a hit following the incursion into Laos and this picture of a South Vietnamese soldier 
hanging on to the skids of a helicopter coming back into South Vietnam. It was indicative of, of the bad PR that ultimately resulted from, from that operation. Uh, U.S. troop numbers uh, were going down uh, and Nixon's approval ratings were going up. More Americans approved of Nixon's handling of the war than disapproved, even as increasing numbers of Americans continued to say that it was a mistake to send American troops to Vietnam in the first place. It was in that context that the New York Times began to publish the contents of a secret Pentagon study from 1967 that reviewed the course of US-Vietnamese relations since the Second World War, a study that the press came to call the Pentagon Papers. Uh, it revealed that in private, uh, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations often spoke about the war in, in deeply pessimistic terms, while in public, they frequently highlighted its progress, even discerning light at the end of the tunnel, as Johnson officials would proclaim just before the Tet Offensive of January 1968. Nixon initially reacted to the leak by focusing how it reflected poorly on Kennedy and Johnson, even as he sought to find it and punish the leakers themselves. But he then turned uh, and saw the disclosure as much more dangerous and threatening if these secrets could be revealed, he figured. Others could too, including his secret diplomacy with the Soviets, with the Chinese, with the North Vietnamese, and also with the South Vietnamese on a very sensitive subject. Nixon's own efforts and those of his campaign to forestall negotiations at the tail end of the 1968 campaign and to prevent Democrat Hubert Humphrey from benefiting from a bombing halt that Johnson called just days before the election. So Nixon decided to cut down on all leaks uh, and particularly to gather up those materials he thought that Johnson officials had about Nixon's bombing halt operation. But he also decided to conduct a broader campaign of surveillance, harassment, and disinformation against perceived enemies. And to that end, he created the Plumbers, uh, an extra legal outfit to engage in these dirty tricks. You can get a, the flavor of his mindset in creating the Plumbers in the following clip, made four days after Times first began publishing the Pentagon Papers. And in this snippet, we'll hear Bob Haldeman, Nixon's chief of staff, Henry Kissinger, again, the national security advisor, John Ehrlichman, uh, Nixon's domestic policy advisor. And at the beginning, you'll hear Haldeman uh, refer to blackmailing Johnson. Uh, that's in effect to encourage Johnson to speak out uh, in defense of Nixon's approach to, to uh, the crisis, to going after the leakers and to preventing the Pentagon paper from being further published. The, uh, you can blackmail Johnson and his stuff. Uh, you can blackmail Johnson and his stuff, uh, and it might be worth doing. Uh, the bombing stuff is all in the same file, or in some of the same hands. Oh, how does that show? Oh, I wonder if it's got it, it, it is in this, it is in these papers, but the whole bombing hall file, do we have it? I asked for it, you said you didn't have it. We, can we have had nothing here, Mr. President. I asked for that because I need yeah, it. But Bob and I have been trying to put the damn thing together. We have a basic history of us constructing our own, but there is a file on it. Or Houston, where she got, there's a file on it. Isn't that right? I wouldn't be surprised. All right, all right. All right. You remember Houston, the same kind of sick out of Bob, the same piece of Bob. I do remember Houston's plan. But couldn't we go over, now Brookings has no right to, to have a plan. You know, I, I mean, I want to implement it on a deep basis, not have to get in and get those files. Oh, the same again. Ultimately, tapes of conversations like this one, once they became available to those who were investigating the crimes and activities associated with the Watergate break-in, would contribute to the unraveling of the Nixon administration, the end of Nixon's presidency. Uh, they'd also reveal how dangerous it is for a president to surround himself with advisors who won't check his most destructive impulses, one of the lessons that comes through in, in these particular recordings. More broadly for us, uh, looking back on this history, um, the recordings helped shine a light on the presidency itself, particularly those moments of crisis and opportunity, uh, such as the one I've offered today, uh, and that's why I find this cartoon uh, in particular intriguing, uh, and we can interpret it in several different ways. You can see the tapes as 
stomach ultimately for Nick that it ended his presidency. But uh, the tapes also helped to break through the facade of the White House uh, and give us some more transparency on, on how power is used uh, in the people's name. Uh, and just to circle back to some of the lessons on leadership we might discern from, from these clips, uh, I'd, I'd cite the following. First off, presidents need to establish systematic process for examining policy options so that all viable options uh, and their implications are on the table as came through in both the Bay of Pigs and in the Missile Crisis. Clear, consistent, and specific communications are essential tools for making uh, or implementing effective policy, as Kennedy came to see in the aftermath of all this. Presidents should also cultivate relationships on both sides of the aisle, as Johnson would do continually, as those relationships become particularly valuable when times get tough. Presidents should main, remain cognizant of their ability to use the powers of the federal government and of their own office to alleviate suffering and to make a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable among us, as Johnson would do after Hurricane Betsy. Having a broader strategic sense of where you wanna go is also vital so that an administration might pursue opportunities more nimbly when they arise, such as with Nixon and China. And then finally, presidents should surround themselves with advisors who can say no. Not that presidents will always listen to them, but so that presidents can be saved from giving free reign to their most destructive tendencies, with Watergate and Nixon being a case in point. And uh, with that, I'd, I'd stop and, and be happy to take your questions. Mark, thank you. That was just terrific. Um, boy, there's so much there. And um, and when Mark says he's happy to take your questions, uh, he means it and I mean it too. Please send your questions in. Uh, thanks to you registering, I can see who's out there. And we have a really national crowd uh, from coast to coast, uh, north to south on the East Coast and several people out West. We're just delighted with the terrific uh, turnout, both in, in number and in quality. It's a great group. Let me start with a couple questions as the questions roll in here. Uh, Mark, one thing that I'm struck in the examples that you use across these three presidencies is um, that they're constantly balancing domestic politics, including at the very local level, whether it's in Alabama and Mississippi for Kennedy um, or in, uh, uh, in New Orleans for Johnson or down the street and over at Brookings. Thanks for that example there, which has always uh, hit home for me uh, on Nixon. Um, while they're managing these grand international challenges, could you talk about that a little bit across these three presidents? How you see that playing out in political science, we talk about it as the two level game. But since you know all three presidencies pretty well, were, was one president or the other more attuned to the domestic politics um, or, or managed it better? That's a great question. Yeah, I think they're all uh, incredibly attuned to both. You know, get to that, uh, the, the pinnacle of, of American political life with being uh, pretty cognizant of all the dynamics swirling around you. Uh, and mostly for them to ar arrive at those positions, they're, they're domestic political dynamics. Uh, certainly with Kennedy and Nixon, you have people who were particularly interested in, in foreign policy. Um, I would say that, that, that the two domains are, are constantly interwoven, uh, that they're really not considering one without the other. Uh, and therefore, we really shouldn't expect presidents now and, and in the future to, uh, to, to try to separate them out too much because they are so inter, interwoven. Policy is getting formulated in, in a domestic political environment, um, as well as in a political environment within uh, the executive branch and, and, and the government a, as a whole. So, uh, so they're really quite conscious of, of both of them at the same time. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that it's a boon to the public. Uh, Johnson, for instance, uh, has roundly been criticized uh, during, uh, for his, his actions during the course of 1964 for not more energetic with the way that he approached Vietnam, that he was essentially waiting until November, till he got elected again to do anything significant about Vietnam. Uh, and McGeorge National Security Advisor, uh, as well as others, would describe 1964 as a wasted year. So there's an there's one example of how um, politics can can really be the end of strategy. In fact, 
that's one of the, the chapters of, of a, on, on Bundy and, and kind of lessons learned from these moments um, that presence should, should take to heart, uh, that, uh, that politics can often get in the way of, of uh, strategic thought. It's a challenge to try to minimize it, but uh, I think to, to the benefit of, of, of their own administrations, to their own policymaking, to their own strategy, they should try to, to subordinate that as much as possible. Um, let me ask one more question in that regard, uh, particularly on both the Nixon and the Johnson one. Nixon, ultimately, his undoing is focusing so much on domestic criticism, right? He's, he's uh, the things that he gets wound up in for, uh, in Watergate, are going after domestic energies, uh, enemies for perceived enemies. For Johnson, he's constantly, or at least in the clip you show, constantly reaching across the aisle. Is that an accurate perception of both? Was, was Nixon um, also reaching across the aisle and finding allies? Was Johnson also attacking enemies? What, um, what, what more can you tell us about how they played politics? Uh, I think Johnson was attacking enemies uh, in his own way as, as much as, as Nixon was. Johnson certainly mobile the offices of the federal government, um, particularly the FBI uh, uh, in, and CIA in ways that flouted the mandates of, of, of these organizations. Uh, the COINTELPRO operation in, in um, you know, uh, uh, trying to, to worm his way into the activities of the anti-war groups in particular, uh, Johnson, Johnson targets as well. Um, I would say in terms of, of the, the bipartisan element here, uh, Johnson did some more than, than Nixon. And I think, again, Johnson had some more to do so, uh, clear, particularly after the, the 1964 election, where the country was going. And, and Johnson had more or less a mate to pursue the kinds of, of a great society uh, programs that he had sketched out broadly in, in 1964, and folks like Everett Dirksen, the, the Senate Minority Leader, Republican, uh, recognized that it would be better to get on board with Johnson at that point. So Johnson was able to work quite well with, with Dirksen. I think from Nixon's perspective, uh, working more closely with Congress and, and particularly with the Democrats would have served him better. Uh, particularly in the denouement of, of Vietnam, because the way that, that Vietnam ends up, it just leaves a really bitter taste in the mouths of, of all Americans. Nixon targeting the Democrats for, uh, for being appeasers, for, uh, for uh, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, and the, the legacy of that in American political culture is really quite noxious. So on, on the one hand, I would say that Johnson is probably more likely to move in that direction. Remember, he had been uh, in the Senate for a longer time than Nixon had, but had been a Senate majority leader for a while. So it came fairly naturally to him. Nixon was uh, much more of a firebrand, uh, was much more suspicious, was much more paranoid, I would say. Uh, and so Johnson was able to, to, to mobilize that, that bipartisanship uh, better than Nixon was. Mark, Thomas Little asks uh, if you would compare LBJ and JFK as crisis managers. I love the concise set of um, recommendations that, that you gave, and you don't have to go through each of them comparing the two, but they do provide a really good framework of um, of how uh, a president or any leader should manage a crisis. Could you compare the two of them? Yeah, I think uh, Kennedy clearly learned and uh, that's, that's one of the key markers of an effective leader is, is to learn from your mistakes. JFK made a, a, a really poor decision or a series of really poor decisions that led up to the, the Bay of Pigs and he course corrected uh, over, uh, over the course of 1960 to 1962. And, uh, you know, some of the things that he did, as I mentioned, in terms of process, um, he, he created the situation in, in the basement of the White House that allowed him to get 
information um, more rapidly and to spread it um, more expeditiously as well. Uh, the, the changes in personnel he had, had mentioned as well. Uh, Kennedy frequently used task forces uh, to try to address particular crises. Uh, there were some downsides to that. Uh, they were frequently ad hoc and improvised, and that was part of Kennedy's operating style. Uh, it was much more free flowing as he wanted it to be uh, compared to what had come before in the Johnson administration. But it also meant that Kennedy's approach to, to managing policy and, and certainly crises wasn't as methodical uh, as it had been. Uh, Johnson, uh, and, and then I, I would go back just to Kennedy for a second and, and say that while Kennedy assembled these task forces, he also liked to have a lot of people around the table at the same time and have a lot of, of give and take and, and support out um, the better from, from the worse arguments. That's not how Johnson handled things. Uh, Johnson was famously averse to having a lot of dissension and conflict in the meetings in which he was a part of. So oftentimes what would happen, and this is particularly true of, of policymaking on Vietnam, the principals, uh, Secretary of State Dean Rusk or Secretary of State Bob McNamara, uh, they would get together with Bundy, kind of work out an agreed position beforehand and then present it to Johnson uh, so that they were all relatively on the same page. Uh, these meetings often would take place uh, with limited groups of people. Um, the Tuesday afternoon lunch was a, 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 a moment that was used frequently to try to work out some of the most important uh, decisions that they would make, uh, particularly with, with regard to Vietnam. And Johnson would have done a lot better, I think, had he widened the circle more. That said, uh, and just to, to kind of conclude on this, you know, Johnson does reach out for um, the voices of those beyond his administration. He assembles the wise men, these pillars of American establishment um, at several points during, uh, during his Vietnam uh, trials and tribulations from 65 through 68 uh, to get the, the, uh, their sense of, of how Vietnam was playing in the country, but also what he should do about it. Um, and that was effective, I think. In fact, it was the final meeting with the wise men in, in uh, March of 1968 that eventually convinced Johnson that he did not have a future in prosecute, uh, prosecuting the war anymore, and that it was really time to look for um, a negotiated solution. Um, and that's uh, that meeting was, I think, five days before Johnson decided to to give it up, to, to uh, pull back from, from um, bombing North Vietnam anymore and uh, to forego pursuing the, the Democratic nomination. Um, Mark, Gerald uh, Falstrom asks, how big a factor was Nixon's foray into China as a diversion from Vietnam? Uh, I think it's a totally fascinating question and, and gets at a lot of different things. And, I say that as a prelude to a webinar we're having on Monday. Uh, can rivals cooperate about U.S.-China relations? Yeah, I'd say that that um, anything Nixon could do that would be a diversion from Vietnam would have, would have been great for him. Keeping in mind at the same time that he was generally able to play it well uh, from the perspective of, of public opinion, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, his approval ratings on Vietnam were generally positive. Uh, they certainly were uh, in his honeymoon period in, in 1969, but they continued to be north of those, uh, those figures who, who uh, said that he was doing a bad job on, on Vietnam. Uh, but Vietnamization wasn't really going terribly well. And so once it became clear that that was the case, you know, the idea was to try to to outfit the South Vietnamese so they could handle themselves once the United States left. Uh, Nixon wanted to, to, to make sure that Vietnam would cook. He continued to bring the, the troop numbers down, but that people wouldn't really focus on how much of a difficult time South Vietnamese were having uh, in, uh, uh, in, in holding their own. Um, so China, yes, uh, that was that was certainly a diversion. His uh, his symmetry with the Soviet Union was also a, a very helpful diversion for him, uh, and those two kind of went in tandem during uh, the latter part of 1971 
even though the summits themselves came about in 72, there are um, uh, lots of visits that Henry Kissinger will have back and forth that get publicized in the media. And that's great for Nixon. And it's particularly great for Nixon once Watergate becomes a thing. And then he'll do anything he can to try to divert attention from what's happening to him uh, domestically. Uh, Mark uh, Carter Hoer asks, have you found that these presidents modified their conversations in these recordings knowing they would be listened to later? In other words, did they spin what they were saying with long-term legacy in mind? I'm guessing Nixon didn't think that when, uh, when he wanted to break into Brookings on a thievery basis. But um, are there other instances where you think they're actually playing to the tape, not just uh, playing to the others in the room? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it, it's something that we, we wrestle with uh, because we're, we're conscious of that question uh, when we transcribe the tapes and, and we have a, a great team that, that, that does that. Um, at the same time, our sense is that generally um, the presidents, uh, particularly Nixon, because his system was voice activated, it was just running whenever he was in a room in which the system existed so that he didn't have to turn a switch on and off. So he wasn't probably as conscious as the others might have been. So for instance, Kennedy's system was manually activated. He actually had to flip a switch. So he knew which conversations were being taped and, and which weren't. And then for Johnson, uh, on his telephone conversations, he would indicate to a secretary that they should tape a particular conversation. Um, you know, none of no, them and just, and, and on the Kennedy, And on the Kennedy point, one of the fascinating tapes that Mark shared with me recently was Kennedy started this in many ways as an audio diary where he would speak directly into the tape and would start downloading things that happened in meetings. And one of those tapes, it's fascinating. He, he is owning the fact that his own communications had not been clear enough early enough, he's very conscious of the sort of leadership things that you were talking about, and he's recording it explicitly for posterity's purposes. Yeah, it, uh, that's a great point. Uh, and we think that one of the reasons Kennedy started taping his conversations was so that he could use them in real time, um, not just for political purposes. Uh, there's an indication that some of the missile crisis tapes were being transcribed so that it would aid Kennedy in his presidential campaign of 1964, uh, but also so that he could learn from his mistakes. I mean, he, he does it after uh, the Bay of Pigs. He does it after reading Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August uh, and the problems that the, the governments of, of Europe had in, in falling over themselves into, into World War I, and he wanted to make sure that nothing like that happened to him. So. Kennedy is thinking about this in a real time sense. Uh, but uh, to, to circle back to the issue of Johnson and Nixon and, and, and whether or not they were concerned about how these would play later on, none of them thought that, that these would ever become public. Um, the, at the time, the, the, um, the prevailing belief was that these materials were the, the private property of, of the individuals. Uh, who were president um, and not the public property of the American people. And after Watergate uh, and after a series of um, legal decisions, but also congressional actions, uh, these materials uh, were transferred from being the private property of, of those folks to being the public property of the United States. So we got a chance to, to look in on the presidency uh, warts and all. So my, my general sense is, no, they did not. They didn't think these would become pub public. They weren't necessarily playing to the tape. Uh, although there is one moment I would just say when, when Bobby Kennedy was speaking to, to Lyndon Johnson, um, since Bobby knew about um, his brother's system, he figured that Johnson had one going as well. And so it was perhaps a little bit more uh, cautious in what he was saying than otherwise. Uh, Mark, one final question as we're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, uh, Ian Sole asks, are presidents' conversations automatically recorded today? And when would they be made available to the general public? Boy, uh, wouldn't it be great if they were uh, if they were recorded today? I know there are a lot of people who would, who would like to have out those tapes, in, including us. We certainly uh, provide our services uh, in, in the service of, of transcribing them. Uh, but we don't believe that, that presidents uh, 
after Richard Nixon surreptitiously uh, recorded their conversations in the way that presidents from Roosevelt through Nixon did, which is not to say that they didn't record their conversations at all. Uh, we know that uh, from time to time, Ronald Reagan taped his conversations, uh, particularly in uh, or when he was in the Situation Room. These were conversations that he had with foreign leaders. Uh, we know that, uh, that there was some taping that was going on during the Clinton years and uh, certainly in the Obama years uh, when, um, uh, when uh, journalists uh, were recorded, pretty much just so that those presidents could have a record of what was said uh, to, to, uh, to the press. But, but not like this, not like this kind of taping we believe ended with uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, although tantalizingly, uh, if you recall way back when, and I think it was in spring of, of 2017, there was some suspicion that perhaps uh, Donald Trump uh, might have taped uh, a conversation with James Comey um, that might have carried th through some behaviors that Trump had engaged in uh, as a private citizen when he taped his, his uh, uh, phone calls as a, or, or meetings as a as, a, as an entrepreneur and a, and a real estate magnate. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, I think for, the, for uh, the benefit of transparency in American democracy, presidents are not doing this anymore. Uh, but after the Nixon experience, you can probably understand why they'd be reluctant to do so. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It was a, it's just a fascinating tour. Uh, having been with uh, with the center now for about five years and watching Mark and Guillen and the others in the program do their work. Um, it's both extraordinary and we learn something new uh, every day about, uh, about that extraordinary uh, 15 or 14 year period where the taping really happened in earnest. I've captured the other questions uh, that have come in. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to answer them. Um, I really wanna thank Mark uh, and our whole tech team for pulling this together. And for all of you who joined, um, please join us next week on Monday morning. We've got a very special um, almost four hour conference on US-China relations. Uh, we have President Trump's Deputy National Security Advisor, Matt Pottinger, uh, Hillary Clinton's Deputy Secretary of State, who was President Clinton's Deputy National Security Advisor, Jim Steinberg, and our own terrific team of China experts, which is um, wide and deep. Uh, joining us from nine till about 1245, plus a special film that actually goes back to the 1950s, one of the first journalists um, ever uh, to enter Maoist China and who filmed and who uh, re returned to China several times in the 70 years since then to record what was going on. Um, and we'll be interviewing uh, Bob Cohen uh, as well during that session. So we ask you all to, to come back and visit with us again for this very special Miller Center event. And thank you all for, uh, for your support for the center. We can't do without it. Uh, and we know that in this very difficult time, you all have limited time for things like this. Um, and so we're appreciative of your spending your time with us.